CIA, the CIA triad, is more than just a mnemonic. It's more than just three things that we have to remember for some exam. These elements, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, are often highly integrated into qualitative and quantitative formulas in the different spreadsheets that we use for our risk analysis and risk management. So we need to see how we implement CIA-based controls. Let's start with confidentiality. Confidentiality assures that no one except the intended recipient or owner can read the data at rest or data in use, okay, resident or in memory, or data traversing the wired or wireless medium. Encryption is often used to give us confidentiality. As a matter of fact, it's used to guarantee confidentiality. However, we don't always have to use encryption to get confidentiality. Now, the opposite of confidentiality is disclosure. And remember that these goals just don't apply to, to electronic data, okay? It's all type of data. Because remember, medical, financial, insurance records, they're often stored in paper documents or microfiche format. Right? So we need to, we're not just talking about electronic here. So tools that provide confidentiality are physical controls like locks and safes, encryption, like in storage encryption, like CryptLocker and VPNs, access control lists and rules, ACLs, data classification and sensitivity levels. Data integrity is the assurance that data has not been altered intentionally or unintentionally you're protecting against unauthorized changes or corruption of data in its various states. Sometimes the unrealized loss of integrity by corruption or modification to critical data and records could be more detrimental than losing confidentiality. An internal attacker can cover up their tracks by modifying logs. They can embezzle by changing financial records. Okay? Some examples that provide integrity are checksums, cryptographic hashes, or HMACs, and digital signatures. The auditing of logs and records can also discover and prevent data integrity loss. The A of CIA is availability. This is the assurance that data or systems are accessible when they're needed and where they're needed for the purpose that they're needed. Now, these are usually denial of service type attacks or flooding attacks. And availability can be mitigated by using high availability, active standby, active active, clustering technologies, but we can also use load balancing, hot spares of devices and modular components, having a disaster recovery plan and disaster recovery sites, as well as for backups using, using RAID arrays or other types of backup systems, maybe on a network access storage or cloud backup services. CIA, got to know that triad, but also we're going to see the CIA in action as we move through different aspects of this course. We need to be able to categorize data types based on the impact levels of CIA. So the sensitivity levels of data might be needed or determined for certain types of access control models, like MAC models, for example, Bell Apadula, Biba, Clark Wilson, the Chinese Wall. Okay? Data at higher sensitivity levels will obviously have a much more strict and stringent and, of course, costly access controls. The potential impact, if considered high, if loss, of any CIA tenant has a severe adverse effect on operations, systems, assets, applications, and don't forget, people or personnel. Take a look at this table. Uh, this table is from NIST, and it gives us an example of how we can measure impact. We've got this qualitative model here of low, moderate, and high, but this is a very commonly used table. And you can see on the left-hand side in the first column, we have confidentiality, then we have integrity, then we have availability. And this table defines for us, for example, what would be a moderate impact of integrity. Let's take a look at that one in the middle. That would be the unauthorized modification or destruction of information that could be expected to have a serious adverse effect on organizational operations, assets, or individuals. Okay, so 
These definitions are important definitions. They're used by lots of organizations because the NIST is a very powerful resource. So this is an example how we can categorize data based on CIA with potential impact and, of course, each one of those elements. We also have designations of logical and physical assets, okay? Sometimes we do it for the military, government, sometimes for the public sector. Let's take a look at some of these. We have in the government and the military, we have top secret. This is data that you make a great effort and undergo a lot of cost to guarantee the secrecy, okay? Usually very few organizations or very few individuals in the organization have the access to top secret data, okay? So it's basically on a need to know basis. Secret is data that you wanna make a significant effort to keep secure. You'll have more people with access to secret data than top secret data. And of course, on a case by case basis, they can be escalated. So if you think about those born movies where uh, uh, the information to, you know, Black Briar or whatever that was called, you know, Pamela Landy was finally given from secret to top secret uh, access to that data. It's on a case-by-case -case basis, on a need-to-know basis. Confidential, data that you must comply with confidential, confidential requirements, okay? This is the lowest level of classified data in this type of scheme. We also have SBU, sensitive but unclassified, okay? This is data that, it, you know, if it got out, it could be embarrassing. It's not a great security breach, but, you know, it could be an embarrassment to a department or a particular individual. And then we have unclassified. This is data with little or no confidentiality, integrity, or avail availability requirements. I just remembered that just this week, uh, the president uh, had mentioned that he was gonna release all those secret documents about the JFK assassination. Made me think of that when it comes to top secret and secret information. Now from the commercial and private sector, at the top, their top secret would be what we call confidentiality, okay? They're gonna spend a lot of resources and time and money to keep this secure, okay? Trade secrets, formulas, marketing campaigns, maybe employee personnel files, okay? Those may be confidential, those may not be, okay? But uh, you've got private. So the employee resources could be confidential, but they may also just be under the private label, okay? Data that's important to the organization. So we're, we're gonna make a really good effort to maintain the secrecy and the accuracy of the data. You know, HR records, okay? Health records, PHI, maybe salary and bonus information. Uh, if you have any credit card, you know, you have, you have corporate credit cards issued, that information may be under private, okay? But then we have sensitive. This is certain strategic and financial information, okay? Similar to the SBU, sensitive but unclassified level of military government, okay? Some embarrassment can occur, uh, but no serious security breach. And then we have public, where you have no negative impact if this is dis disclosed, okay? This is data that's displayed in marketing literature. Uh, maybe it's on publicly accessible websites, okay? So those are some uh, important differentiations because they're going to tie into our access control models and our architectures and we may be using those object subject levels, okay, those sensitivity levels in our environment. We need to incorporate shareholder input into the CIA triad, which means expert judgment and SME, subject matter expertise. You'll often find this in your own internal stakeholders and you know, don't discount some of those new hires or some of those power users out there. You know, they may not be a manager or a supervisor, but don't underestimate their knowledge that they can bring into the situation, okay? For example, they may have been hired to do a certain job, but they also have expertise in other areas from previous jobs that they had. And that's why it's very important to work with the HR department to locate and document all the skill sets that your employees have, and it should be stored, let's say, in a SharePoint environment or some other uh, environment of, of data information on your stakeholders and your employees. And don't forget external stakeholders as well. Executive management, all the way down to the key department people, okay? Who are the owners of data 
and the custodians of data. And this shareholder input is really critical in the beginning of the life cycle, okay? When you're doing information gathering and your strategy and your planning, uh, you may need stakeholder buy-in and sign-off for certain projects or programs. Project and program stakeholder input, okay? Internal and external should be an ongoing critical success factor, CSF. If you see this diagram, we're going to see this qualitative heat map again later on. I'm just showing it to you now because I want you to realize that a lot of these factors are going to tie into our qualitative security analysis if we're using that type of model. Some organizations may be moving towards more quantitative or semi-quantitative, but a lot of organizations who are you know, using NIST and OWASP and other uh, COBIT uh, methodologies, they're st still using qualitative heat map type information. And so that will tie into, you know, impact, likelihood, and your heat level. So we'll see this again later on, but just remember that it's going to tie into this as well. I want to finish off talking about different categories and types of controls, okay? We need to select and implement controls based on the CIA requirements of our policies. And so there's going to be some overlap here. There'll be overlap in the categories of controls, the three categories, but also the three, the, the, the five types of controls. Now, the three categories, uh, you should know this. This is a kind of a security plus type of thing. You have administ administrative, which is written security policy, AUP, uh, hiring and firing, termination. So administrative and managerial policies your, are controls. You also have technical controls. That's deploying your endpoint protection, your firewalls, your IPS, okay, your proxy services, your access control and firewall rules. The things that you learn how to configure as a Cisco practitioner or a Palo Alto Networks or Barracuda or whatever you're using, those are the technical things. You know, configuring your routers and your switches in a secure fashion. And then physical controls. Those are kind of obvious, right? You know, the physical fencing that you have and, and the, the, the boundary of your, your facility and guards, whether they're armed or not, and the bollards in front of the front door of your building and all of those physical aspects. So we have those, the kind of the three categories. But then we have the types of controls. So first we have preventative, okay? Preventative controls are aimed at preventing the threat from coming in contact with a vulnerability. So a preventive control would be a firewall, a physical lock, and even a security policy. Then we have detective controls. And let me just say this right here, that there, there can be some overlap in these, con these, these types of controls and categories. But detective controls identify that the threat has entered the network or the system. Okay? Examples are log monitoring, uh, correlation, seam systems, net flow, IPS sensors sending alerts, or verbose dumps that can be looked at in, in Wireshark. Surveillance cameras, okay, are a detective control. Then we have corrective controls. This third category, or this third type of control is aimed at mitigating or lessening the effects of a threat that's manifested itself. So going through a quarantine and remediation process with NAC or NAP, you know, your virus cleaning, okay, or cleaning data, uh, maybe cleaning your data loss prevention uh, through file uh, investigation, IPS signature updates after a worm act outbreak, okay? And then we have recovery, recovery types of controls. These put a system back into a certain state, a baseline state of production after an incident. Most of your disaster recovery activities fall into the, the category of recovery, the recovery control, okay? This is often a, a subset of corrective controls. And then finally, we have the deterrent control. Deterrent controls are aimed at discouraging security violations. These could be a subset of preventative controls. So signage, like keep out, or beware of my teenage daughter. No, I'm just, not really. But, you know, signs, visual stickers on windows, okay? Uh, maybe no piggybacking. Uh, policy that you put on all of the areas coming into the building or between floors, okay? Just the mere presence of a control, like a surveillance camera, okay, which we know is detective, can be a deterrent.